Some rules are there to protect us. Look both ways before crossing the street. Don't go with strangers. No jumping on the bed. Don't eat yellow snow. <laughs> Other rules are there to protect Others, no biting, no kicking, no shoving, no fighting, no quarreling, no stealing. We learn these rules when we're young. They're drilled into our heads, and to some degree, our success as adults is measured in large part by how well we live with these rules. Of course, as we get older, new rules are added to the mix. File your taxes by April 15th. No bright on red. It's unprofessional to wear your Superman suit to work. <laughs> Not all rules are worthwhile. <laughs> and the challenge is that when they become too much, they start to get a little burdensome. A few rules, okay, too many, burdensome. And the truth is, we don't always know how to find that balance in our lives. So much of our lives is spent trying to find that balance between freedom and law. We can see it in our current political system, can't we? Trying to balance freedom and law, some for individuals and some for society. And of course, a few out there who think we should have no rules for anyone, because how could that go wrong? The truth is, most of us know that at some level, we need some structure by which to live. We need some understanding commonly agreed upon that will allow us to function freely in this world, that will allow us the freedom to fully live while not impinging on anyone else's freedom to fully live. We have to find that balance between law and freedom. The good news for us, as a people of faith, is that we have it. The good news is that we have a rule, one rule, by which we all are bound to abide. We have one rule that trumps all factions, that trumps all political parties, that is there for us to abide by if we're willing to accept it. To be clear, no biting, no kicking, no shoving, no quarreling still is out there, sorry. But they're really secondary to the primary rule. As a people of faith, our one rule is the rule of love. We are called as a people of faith to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. Full stop. That's it. Now, we don't always do it, but we know that we're supposed to, and we know that by the grace of God, when we do, when we're able to fully embrace that rule, we find life. Not after death, but right now. It's when we embrace that rule of love that we find life. Do you hear? The irony, it's only by submitting to the law of love that we find the freedom to live. But it's really hard to do. The good news is that we don't have to do it alone. That's part of why we're here. We are here, as we said in our baptism, to fumble through this together. And we come from a long line of fellow fumblers. Every one of us has spent all of our lives fumbling our way through this, trying to find our way to fully love God and fully love our neighbor as ourselves. It's nothing new. It's been happening since the start of our faith. In fact, if we're willing, we can learn a little bit from the people who have come before us, the fellow fumblers in our fellowship. We can hear it today in that passage that we've chosen from Paul's letter to the Galatians. You see, the church in Galatia, these people were trying really hard to live faithfully, but they were so stuck on the letter of the law that they missed the spirit of it. Sound familiar? The Methodist church has been doing that now for a while. 
and Paul was writing to set them straight. You see, Paul had started that church in Galatia, and he wanted it to go well. But then, as he was off starting other churches, another group of Christians, well-meaning, came in and started to preach something a little different to that little church in Galatia, and the people started to get a little confused. They were proclaiming a different kind of Christianity. Qua, you say? How could there be a different kind of Christianity? Wasn't Jesus just there? It was only a couple decades after Jesus was roaming around. How could there be another form? What's the deal with that? The truth is, there's never been one agreed-upon form of Christianity. We like to think that there was this beautiful time in which everyone thought the same way, who everyone understood exactly what to believe and how to believe it and went about their business. But the truth is, from the time Jesus left, the people who were standing around were scratching their heads saying, well, what do we do now? They were arguing about the right way forward. As we've seen over the last few weeks, even in our own country, two people can witness the same event and have three or four different responses. We've seen it in the response to Orlando. We've seen it in the conversations around Brexit. We can see the same things and think very differently about them. In other words, we bemoan often the denominationalism in our Christianity. The truth is, we've always thought differently. Perhaps what Paul was trying to remind this early group of Christians is that it's okay to think differently. It's okay to have some differences as long as we can keep the main thing the main thing, which is what he was trying to remind them in this letter. You see, the church in Galatia was not in ancient Palestine. It was in modern-day Turkey. It was a church for the Gentiles, and Paul thought that was fine. But the new Christians who came in said, no, 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 if you are going to be a Christian, first you have to be Jewish. That is, you have to attend the Jewish festivals, you have to attend to the dietary restrictions, and you have to be circumcised. One of those would be harder than the others. And Paul was coming in to tell them, no, there is another way. You can find your way through this if you're willing to try it. You see, there's all, always going to be different forms of the Christian faith. We see it in our scriptures. We hear it in the difference between Paul and James. We hear it in the difference between Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. It's like that old cartoon, if anybody's seen it, where Jesus is sitting around with a group of his disciples and he's saying, Now listen up, everybody. I don't want four different versions of this out there. There's always going to be differences, but Paul begins by trying to set aside all of those things which we use to divide us. We heard it in that part of Galatians we read last week. That is, he begins by leveling the playing field to remind them in Christ there is no Jew or Greek. There's no longer free or slave. There's no longer male or female in all of those things. Christ overcomes. We are no longer bound by those old distinctions. But in our letter for today, he, in our passage for today, he takes it one step further. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. In other words, it's great to recognize that we're all on the same playing field. But then he goes on to say, to what end? These were people who were working really hard at being faithful. They were trying to check every box to make sure they were doing everything right, constantly looking over their shoulder, and he's telling them, you're missing the point. Friends, our faith is not meant to be a burden. It's not meant to be an albatross around our necks. It's meant to set us free for freedom. Christ has set us free. Free. You are called to freedom in Christ. 
As Methodists, we hear in that that promise of free will, that we each have a choice about how we live our lives. Every day we have a choice about how we are going to make that next best decision, that next most loving decision, and the truth is there are going to be times when we fail. There are going to be times when we make a poor decision as individuals, as a church, as a country, as a world. We believe in a universal grace. A grace which promises that there is nothing you can do or say to lose the love of God, which means that each of us in every single moment have the opportunity to choose life. No matter what has come before, we each have the opportunity to choose life if we're willing to embrace it. But Paul seems to recognize that with that freedom comes a challenge. Which, of course, is to take it for granted. If we believe that there's nothing we can do or say to lose the love of God, then it can be easy to rest on our laurels. But in so doing, we miss out on the opportunity for life. Paul says, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. Instead, through love, make yourself slaves to one another. Now, truth be told, this slavery imagery is too much for us. There's too much dark history in our own country and throughout human history to be able to redeem that phrase. But if we're able to see past it to what he's trying to say, then we recognize what Paul is going for, that we are called to bound ourselves to one another, that we to bind ourselves to one another, that we are bound to one another in love, that through love we are called to lo- find a relationship with one another. He says all of the law, all of those checklists that we keep going through, making sure that we're living up to it, all of those things that we keep telling ourselves we have to do in order to be good enough or strong enough or to fit in, all of those can be set aside because really what we are called to do is one thing. All of the law can be summed up in this one commandment. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. You're to love your neighbor as yourself. It's Kant's categorical imperative. It's the golden rule. It's the command of every Christian, We are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. The challenge is that it is so hard to do. Especially in a moment like this. We look around our world and our response is not usually love. It is typically fear. And we offer ourselves any number of things to be fearful about because of the way people love or because of the way people worship or because of the way people look. And so we distance ourselves, whether out of benign ambivalence or purposeful ignorance. Just as love can build up a community, failure to love can tear it down. We see it in our world. The political mess that we find ourselves in right now is bound up not in love of our neighbor, but fear of the other. This movement towards isolationism in our country and around the world is bound up in fear of the other, in worrying about what they might bring with them, about who they are, about how we can protect ourselves. But friends, that is not who we are called to be. We can't love our neighbor through a wall. 
That is not who we are. As people of faith, we are called to love our neighbor. Remember, Jesus was a radical. And when he said, love your neighbor, he didn't mean the people right next door. He meant the people who didn't look like us, who didn't smell like us, who didn't think like us. He meant even our enemies. That is, we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves, and only in so doing will we find life. Not right here. Not just after death, but right here and now. That is what we are called to be doing. But Paul recognized that this is hard to do, and so he gives us some signs what to look for. It's much easier to talk about love than it is to actually live it. And so he gives us some ways to know if we're doing a good job, what to look out for. First, he names what we should look out for on the negative side. That is, he says, these are those works of the flesh, the sins of the flesh that we might recognize when we're heading in the wrong direction. We'll know a few of them. That is, fornication and licentiousness and enmity and anger and bitterness and feuding and quarreling. Does any of this sound familiar? It's when we abuse our relationships with one another. When we make another person a means to an end as opposed to an end in and of themselves. Paul says that those who live by the works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. Too often we hear that as a warning about not getting into heaven, but that's not what it says and it's not what we believe. Remember, our faith is not about what happens to us when we die. It's about what happens when we live here and now, right now, the kind of life that we start now and continue straight through death. That is what Paul is trying to tell us. The kingdom of God is that promise for a world in which we all finally and fully live as Christ commanded, when we finally and fully live by loving our neighbor as ourselves. And so long as a few of us don't, then none of us will get to experience that promised kingdom. But friends, there is hope. Because we can, as human beings, as people, look out for the other. We can find our way into love and we will see signs of it. It's what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. Those signs that love is at work in our world. And it begins with love. The first sign of love is love. It's like that wonderful speech by Lin-Manuel Miranda at the Tony Awards. Love is love is love is love is love. Love breeds love. But it's not the only sign. There is joy and peace and gentleness and kindness and self-control and generosity. All of these things that come out when we're finally able to relate to one another, not just as an object, but as a person. Face to face. Heart to heart soul to soul. Friends, we're called to practice love not just with our mouth, but with our feet. To go into those places that are in need of a little joy, or in need of a little peace, or in need of a little gentleness, that are in need of a little kindness, that are in need of a little self-control or patience, and to bring it to them. All of those places that are in need to love, we are called to go with our feet to those places. This is fruit by the foot. This is what we are called to do, to be God's people in the world, to look out for our neighbors, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And it's much easier to say than it is to do. And each and every one of us, each and every day, have to make a conscious decision to choose life. The truth of the matter, friends, is that we all have rules by which we are called to abide in this world. And some are more cumbersome than others. Some are there just to keep us down. But there is one that is there to set us free. That in Christ we find that perfect balance between freedom and law through love. 
And even if we make a mistake, by the grace of God, each day we have a chance to pick up the reins again and to choose life. Some laws are there to protect us. Some are there to protect others. But only one is there to save the world. May it be so. Amen.